You are listening to Matthew Godfrey, the Historic Church's Support Officer, and I'm now going to tell you about church maintenance. Church maintenance is something that all parishes need to think about on a regular basis if they are going to avoid large, unexpected repair bills. All church buildings, regardless of age, size, and what they are made of, need maintenance. Recent research has shown that where simple maintenance tasks, such as replacing a slip slate or tile, repairing a leaking downpipe or gutter, or unblocking a drain, are not attended to in a timely manner, if left, can turn a job of perhaps a few hundred pounds into a job of many thousands of pounds. The research also shows that this happens relatively quickly and may result in the need for substantial grant funding in order to undertake the repair. In this video, we will guide you through some of the simple maintenance tasks that can save you money and extend the life of the materials that your church is built from. In Lincolnshire, we have a wonderful inheritance of church buildings, many of which are listed at grade one or two star and thus are of national importance. All these church buildings are unique and come with different challenges. For example, a Victorian church can be a more complex building than a medieval one, and if your church has a number of building phases stretched out over a number of centuries, this will impact on how you need to care for it. Our church buildings have been around for centuries, and this is testament to their construction and their longevity. All materials used, with the exception of more modern additions, are traditional materials. Stone, timber, lime mortar, lime render or plaster, lead and ceramic such as brick and tile, all of which would have been sourced relatively locally. These materials can last many centuries if maintained and cared for correctly. However, lack of maintenance, inappropriate repairs and materials can substantially reduce the working life of traditional building materials. As I will go on to explain, Time is not the chief enemy of our church buildings, it is water, which is harmful to both timber work and masonry. A blocked downpipe, leaking gutter or choked up parapet gutter can all result in water spilling into the wall fabric. And where this occurs, adjacent timber work such as roof timbers, timber beams, wood panelling, pews and pew platforms could all be at risk of timber decay in the form of wet rot or dry rot. The former is where the timber has a high moisture content, such as a beam end or a rafter foot, and where this happens, localised rot can become established. Timber damaged in this way may need an expensive repair costing many thousands of pounds, especially if you consider how difficult it is to repair roof timbers at height. Such repairs can be avoided if a relatively small amount had been spent on repairing a leaking gutter joint or unblocking a downpipe in the first place. A worse case scenario than localised wet rot is dry rot or circular lacrimons. This thrives on damp timbers where there is little or no ventilation, so pew platforms and roof timbers concealed above ceilings in a poorly ventilated roof space are particularly vulnerable to this. Dry rot can be far more damaging as its tendrils can travel beyond the initial outbreak along water joints and behind plasterwork. However, it can be stopped if the ventilation is improved and the moisture content of the timber is below 20%. Dry rot will almost always result in expensive timber repairs and may also require localised chemical treatments. So again, this kind of remedial work can be expensive and potentially avoided with careful and timely maintenance. Damp timbers can also be vulnerable to insect damage, most commonly from the common furniture beetle and the death watch beetle. Both exploit the softer sapwood of softwood and hardwood respectively, where the moisture content is above 15%. In a well-maintained and ventilated church, the right conditions for such infestations can be kept to a minimum. However, where timber is already moist due to a leaking roof or gutter and partly damaged by wet rot, the perfect conditions can arise for both types of beetle and the damage caused can be more severe. Over time, they may need major repair if the damaged timber is a beam end or rafter foot, for example. The best way to prevent damage is to ensure that the church building is kept watertight and well ventilated. But do bear in mind that beetles may have been present in your church building for centuries and in most cases, the damage is likely to be superficial but the correct diagnosis of the problem is crucial 
and remedial treatments that may work in a modern building aren't necessarily the correct treatments in a historic church building. Water damage can also be a serious problem in masonry too. The walls of most medieval churches consist of an outer and inner skin of stonework with a central core of rubble and mortar. This construction technique can last many centuries, provided the building remains stable and no cracks occur and let the water into the fabric, and that rainwater goods, parapet and valley gutters are well maintained. If, however, water can get in via one or more of these problems, the wall core can eventually lose its solidity and may start to fail. A problem that can be further exacerbated by harsh winters and freeze-thaw action. Walls that are wetter than they should be can usually be identified by floral growth externally, such as buddleia, ivy, moss and ferns on wall surfaces, which may indicate a leaking downpipe or gutter. Stonework in these areas, too, appears to be damp and may have washed out mortar joints if the problem has been going on for a while. Internally, algae growth, crumbling plasterwork and flaking paint are also a good indication of the same problem. Rusting iron cramps and fixings on the wall monuments caused by a damp wall can also become a problem too and monuments, depending on their significance, are not usually a simple fix. There are other issues we face with church masonry, mostly in more recent times, and that is well-meaning repairs carried out with inappropriate materials. Traditional buildings are almost always constructed with lime mortar. Lime mortar is a breathable material and in a sense sacrificial, being softer than the stone it surrounds. It also means it weathers away before the stone it holds together. The more modern mortars, which include cement, are not nearly as breathable and are far harder than lime mortar. This means that cement mortar is often harder than the stone it holds. Thus, stone starts to weather away first, leaving ribbons of cement mortar on a wall surface where the stone work has receded. The reason the stone starts to recede more quickly is because cement mortar, being less breathable, holds onto the water more, and as a consequence, the edge of the stone stays wetter for longer, making them vulnerable to frost action. Another problem with cement mortar is that it can exacerbate internal moisture levels. I have just mentioned that historic buildings need to breathe, and cement mortar can really hinder this process, which in turn can increase interior moisture levels and condensation. Dampness at the base of church walls internally is something we have all seen, no doubt, and this has in the past been called rising damp. This, however, is not a term commonly used in conservation these days and is perhaps one of the most misdiagnosed aspects of historic church buildings, as there are a number of other causes. In reality, the problem has been around as long as church buildings, but one aspect of low-level dampness in walls is unique to churches, and that is due to the churchyard. Perhaps by, say, the 14th century, most churchyards would have been getting a little crowded. And where this has been the case, the best way forward would have been to expand the area of the churchyard. But where this was not possible, new graves were dug through the old ones. When this practice of overburial happened, the ground would rise around the church building and the moist earth would press higher up against the masonry walls. This would leave the internal floor level lower than the outside, so the base of the walls would become damp. Additionally, the church would effectively be in a hollow, so all the water could pond in the soil around it. Dampness on interior walls can manifest in a number of ways, some of which I've already mentioned, but again it mostly comes down to maintenance issues and materials used. Cement render and plastic based emulsion paints, which have been used in churches, cause breathability problems and can drive the damp issues elsewhere. After crumbling plaster and flaking paint, another way damp shows itself is through a sort of tide mark. This tide mark shows up as a line of salts on the surface, which can be easily brushed off. These salts, though, are a good indicator of a much deeper problem. If water is getting into the wall from above, the moisture may pick up soluble salts from within the wall core and then deposit them where they come to the surface, usually an impermeable barrier such as an arch, a monument or a door opening, etc. This can often be diagnosed as rising damp when in fact it is coming from higher up. These salts, however, can come from below too. If, for example, the low level lime render has been repaired with cement render, moisture can be driven up the wall to a certain extent, 
by this impermeable barrier and appear as a tide line above it. Another often overlooked issue with damp is through the floor. Church floors in the medieval period were likely to have been compacted earth or clay with tiles only used in certain areas. Over time, stone flagstones get put down as do ledger stones and tiles of all sorts which can hinder breathability and given that at least 50% of the moisture content in churches comes up through the floor, you can see this could become a problem. Of course, we can't take up ledger stones, flagstones or tiles, but we can help by not putting down non-breathable carpets. A breathable variety is always preferable and can take the form of a sisal or coir matting, for example. If a non-breathable carpet is used, to cover a large area, the moisture is driven up into the walls and also the stone piers where a tide mark may be visible and the carpet may become saturated. Essentially damp, whichever way it shows itself, needs careful diagnosis unless it is immediately obvious where the problem lies. Good and timely maintenance can get rid of most of the damp in combination with traditional breathable materials and ventilation, the latter of which I will be looking at shortly. There is of course a further issue with water and that is drainage. Getting the water off of the building through downpipes and gutters is only half the story. You also need to get it away from the building too. And this is where drainage is so important. And again, as with rainwater goods and roof drainage, needs to be maintained too. I'm sure we all know that drainage around historic church buildings can be a bit of a mystery. There may be gullies which downpipes drain into, but the mystery is where do the drains go and how do you flush them through if they look blocked? If it is a more modern system, they may go into a soakaway in the churchyard or into a mains drain if your church happens to be in a more urban location. These drains can usually be cleared if blocked and will work again. The problems start when things are a little less certain. Some churches have a stone or concrete apron around them, which are less than ideal as they can drive moisture into the walls at low level. But with their expensive relaying of drains, many churches are stuck with this arrangement so you have to make the best of it. In terms of maintenance, keep these aprons weed free and if they are cracked, get a local builder to grow up the cracks to try and keep the rainwater where it should be. Some of these have gullies, others don't. If you have gullies, try and keep them clear of debris. A further problem can be manifest in the church if it has been provided with a French drain or similar arrangement. This is a channel that has been dug around the perimeter of all or part of the building and then filled with coarse gravel. It may or may not have a land drain or similar placed within it. There aren't many French drains around our churches due to the disturbance and cost involved with the important archeology span around the footprint of the building. Where they have been used, it is vital they are kept maintained and clear as they do have the tendency to silt up and have the complete opposite effect as to what they were designed for and can become a sump thereby increasing dampness in the church floor and lower walls. As I'm sure you know, church buildings are drafty. This is due to their age and the materials used. As we have just discussed, these buildings need to breathe, so these drafts are important to the health of the building, but it can be uncomfortable for the people who use it. Maintaining ventilation is important, but there can be improvements made which are not to the detriment of the structure. For church buildings, it has been estimated that about 15 to 20% of heat loss is via drafts, so there are things that can be done. Simple things help, like repairs to broken quarries and windows, repair decayed and broken door frames for instance. The latter is not always applicable in our more ancient churches if the stone surround is damaged, for example, or the door is very ancient. Some churches have heavy curtains in front of the main door or doors, and these can help. Similarly, a simple draft excluder placed at the bottom of the door can help too. However, if you use either of these, make sure they do not impede a fire door when the building is in use. They can however be used if your heating needs to warm up in advance of a service before the building is occupied. Relative humidity is a term I'm sure you are familiar with. It can play a big part in the health of air church buildings and the comfort of the building users. The physics of it is that warm air can hold more moisture than cold air. This is the basis of cloud formation and why you get condensation on the bathroom mirror when you have a shower. 
Moisture condenses where warm air meets something cold. And as the air cools, it can no longer carry as much moisture and essentially has to put it down. Cold surfaces in churches can be walls, floors, and the underside of metal roofs, such as lead and copper. With correct ventilation, the risks can be lessened, but if the building is already damp through a leaking downpipe or gutter, or has been repaired with modern, non-breathable materials, the condensation will be worse. A damp wall or building will have a lower insulation value and conduct the heat of the building by cooling the interior through evaporation. A high relative humidity inside the building can make it uncomfortable for building users and at certain times of the, of the year make it feel cooler, increasing heating bills and also increasing the building's carbon footprint. High humidity and damp, as we know, are the primary agencies of decay. So maintenance and breathable materials are important in helping to prevent this, as is ventilation. This can be done quite easily in the summer months. If the church door can be kept open, with a mesh bird guard on the porch, for instance, if your church has one. Another way is through the use of the building's hopper head vents. These are small windows normally operated by a cord or a chain. I mention these quite a lot to parishes when we speak about QI reports. I always suggest getting opening windows to open properly during the warmer months to ensure that good ventilation is maintained throughout the church. In the colder months, however, these hopper head windows, because of the fact that they are usually metal framed, can be a bit drafty and uncomfortable to stand next to. I have come across a conservation minded solution to this, which is completely reversible. And that is to find some black plasticine and push in around the frame to seal the gap. This will cut out the drafts and can easily be removed once it is warm enough to use the windows again. Keeping windows open during the warmer months is easy, but in the winter months, too much ventilation will mean that the building will be impossible to heat, so it's a bit of a balancing act depending on the frequency of use, the weather and the exterior temperature. Too little could mean condensation and mould growth, so each building needs to be considered differently. One final point often overlooked are air bricks or wall vents for timber flooring. Make sure these are kept clear so that you do get good subfloor ventilation to ensure that timber floors are less likely to decay. These are one aspect that you should not block up to cut down drafts. Finally, I hope I've shown you how regular maintenance can help avoid or at least delay large repair bills. Regular maintenance will also mean that your church is better insulated if the fabric is drier, which in turn will reduce heating bills and reduce the carbon footprint. There are a number of resources that are available to help with maintenance and these are included on our website. Thank you for watching this training video. Do have a look at others in the series and if you have any questions, please contact us at the Church Buildings team.